everybody. How are you all? Well, the topic for this evening is the Trinity. The definition. The central doctrine of religious of religions of Christendom. According to the Athanasian's Creed, there are three divine persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, each said to be eternal, each said to be almighty, none greater or less than another, each said to be God, and yet together being put as one God. Other statements of the dogma empathize that these three persons are not separate and distinct individuals, but are three models in which the divine essence exists. Thus, some Trinitarians empathize their belief that Jesus Christ is God, or that Jesus and the Holy Ghost are Jehovah not a Bible teaching. Okay. What is the origin of the Trinity Doctrine? Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> the New Encyclopedia Britannica says, Neither the word Trinity nor the explicit doctrine as such appears in the New Testament or did Jesus and his followers intend to contradict the sh Shem, the Shema, in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6 4. The doctrine developed gradually over several centuries and through many controversies. By the end of the 4th century, the doctrine of the Trinity took substantial uh, substantially the form it has maintained ever since. 1976 Micropedia Volume 5 Page 126 the New Catholic Encyclopedia states, The formulation, one God in three persons, is not solidly established. Certainly not fully assimilated into Christian life. And, it, and, its, prof, and its profession of faith. Prior to the end of the 4th century, oh, I read that completely wrong. The New Encyclopedia, the New Catholic Encyclopedia states, the formulation, one God in three persons, was not solidly established, certainly not fully assimilated into Christian life and its profession of faith prior to the end of the 4th century. But it, but it is precisely this formulation that has first claimed to, to the title the Trinitarian Dogma. Among the Apostolistic Fathers, there had been nothing even remotely approaching such a mentally or such a mentality or perspective. 1967. Uh, volume sixteen, page two hundred and ninety-nine, and that other one, the uh, Micropedia, it's volume ten. Sorry, it's Roman numerals. <laughs> I'm not too good at that. Remembering which one, the V and the X. In the Encyclopedia America, we read. Christianity de derived from Judaism, and Judaism was strictly 
Unitarian, believing that God is one person. The road which led from Jerusalem to Nicaea was sacredly a straight one. 4th century Trinitarianism did not reflect accurately early Christian teachings regarding the nature of God. It was, on the contrary, a deviation from this teaching. 1956, volume 27 of the Encyclopedia America. Um, according to the Nuvian Dictionary Universal, the Platonic Trinity itself merely a rearrangement of older trinities dating back to the early earlier peoples appears to be the rational philosophy philosophic trinity of attributes that gave birth to the three hypostates or divine persons taught by the Christian churches Catholic churches. This Greek philosophers, Plato, 4th century BCE, concept of the divine trinity can be found in all the ancient pagan religions. Paris, 19, uh, sorry, 1865 to 1870, edited by M. Lacheur, volume 2, page 1467. John L. Mackenzie, S.J. In this dictionary of the Bible, in his dictionary of the Bible, sorry, says, The trinity of persons within the unity of nature is defined in terms of person and nature, which the Greek philosoph philosophy terms um, actually the term do not appear in the Bible the, Trinitar the Trinitarian definition definitions arose as the result of long controversies in which these terms and others such as essence and substance were erroneously implied to by God some theologians. New York, 1965, page 899. Even though, as Trinitarians acknowledge neither the word Trinity nor a statement of the Trinitarian dogma is found in the Bible, other concepts that are embodied in the dogma found there? Does the Bible teach? that the Holy Spirit is a person. Some individual texts refer, uh, that refer to the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost from the King James Version might seem to indicate personally, uh, personality. For example, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a helper, Greek parakelot, Caritos. Con. Advocator. That teaches, bears, witness, speaks, and hears. John 14, 16, 17, uh, 26, 15, 15, and 26. And sixteen thirteen, but other texts say that people were filled with Holy Spirit, that some were baptized with it or anointed with it. Luke one forty four, Matthew three eleven, Acts ten thirty eight. These latter references to Holy Spirit definitely do not fit a person. To understand what the Bible as a whole teaches, all these texts must be considered. That is the response. That is the responsible conclusion. 
that the first text cites here employ a figure of speech personifying God's Holy Spirit, his active force, as the Bible also per personifies wisdom, sin, death, water, and blood. See also pages 380 and 381 under the heading Spirit in this book, which is called Reasoning from the Scriptures. Acts 7, 55 and 56 reports that Stephen <clears throat> was given a vision of heaven in which he saw Jesus standing at the right side, at the right hand of God. But he made no mention of seeing the Holy Spirit. See also Revelation 7, 10, 22, 1 and 3. The New Catholic Encyclopedia admits the majority of New Testament texts reveal God's Spirit as something, not someone. This is, this is especially seen in the parallelism uh, between the Spirit and the power of God. 1967, volume X. I, 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 <laughs> page 575. That was easier. It also reports the apologists, the apologists, Greek Christian writers of the second century spoke too haughtily of the spirit with a measure of anticipation, one might say. To, Im to impersonally. That didn't make any sense. It also reports the in the Apologist, Greek Christian writers of the second century spoke to haughtily, sport, spoke too haughtily of the spirit with a measure of anticipation. One might say to Impersonality, volume XIV, page 296. Does the Bible agree with those who teach that the Father and the Son are not separate and distinct individuals? Matthew twenty six thirty nine says, going a little fur, going a little farther, going a little further. He, Jesus Christ, fell on his face and prayed, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Never, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will, wilt. So, not by his will, but by Jehovah's will. If the Father and the Son were not distinct individuals, such a prayer would have been um, meaningless. Jesus would have been praying to himself, of course, and his will would not necessarily have been the Father's will. John 8, 17 and 18 says, Jesus answered the Jewish Pharisees, in your law it is written that the testimony of two men is true. I bear witness to myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness to me. So Jesus identif identif identifyingly spoke of himself as being an individual separate and distinct from the Father. See, oh yeah. Um, and that's, that's obvious because Jesus said so many times that he came to make his father's name known, not came to make himself known as God. Does the Bible teach that all who are said to be part of the Trinity are eternal, none having beginning? Colossians 1, 15 and 16, he, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth. In what sense is Jesus Christ the firstborn of all creation? Trinitarians say that firstborn here means prime, most excellent, most distinguished. Thus Christ would be understood to be not part of creation, but the most distinguished in relation to those who were created. If that is so, and if the Trinity doctrine is true, why are the Father and the Holy Spirit not also said to be the firstborn of all creation? But the Bible implies that implies this expression only to the Son, according to the customary meaning of firstborn. It indicates that Jesus is the eldest in Jehovah's family of sons, and he's the first creation, and all things were created through him. Uh, before, before Colossians 1.15, the expansion, uh, sorry, the expression, the firstborn of, occurs upwards of 30 times in the Bible and each instance that it is applied to living creatures the same meaning applies the firstborn is part of the group the first of Israel is one of the sons of Israel the firstborn of Pharaoh is one of Pharaoh's family the firstborn of beasts are themselves animals. What then causes some to ascribe a different meaning to to it at Colossians one fifteen? Is it is it Bible usage or is it a belief to which they already hold and for which they seek proof? Does Colossians one sixteen and seventeen include Jesus? from having been created, exclude Jesus from having been created. When it says, in him all things were created, all things were created through him and for him. The Greek word here rendered all things is penta, an infect, uh, infl inflicted from of pus. And inflicted from a, from of pus at Luke uh, thirteen two renders this all other reads any other says anyone else they're different um, in different Bibles just different words that are used you can also see Luke twenty one twenty nine. And Philippians 2.21 In harmony with everything else that the Bible says regarding the Son, um, uh, the new, is it the new world, the, uh, the new Bible, whatever it is, um, assigns the same meaning to Panta, at Colossians 6, oh, well, 1, 16 and 17, so that it reads in part by means okay, of all, of him all other Bible things book. that were created. Are you ready to try I'll read that again. Uh, it assigns the, the same meaning to Penta at Colossians 1, 16 and 17, so as it reads in part by means of him all other things were created. All other things have been created through him and for him. Thus, he is shown to be a created being, part of the creation produced by God. Revelations 1, 1 and 3, 14 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right. The words 
The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning, Greek, arcane, arche, of God's creation, New World Translation, I think it is, as well as other others read similarly, is that rendering correctly no it's not some take the view that what is meant is that the son was the beginner of God's creation that he was the ultimate source but Little and Scott Greek English lexicon lists beginning as its first meaning or of Arche. Oxford, 1968, page 252. The logical conclusion is that the one being quoted at Revelation 3.14 is a creation, the first of God's creations, that he had a beginning. Compare Proverbs uh, 8.22, where as many Bible commentators agree the son is referred to as wisdom personified accordingly according to uh, different Bibles <laughs> the one there speaking is said to be created prophetically with reference to the Messiah Micah 5.2 in the King James Version says His goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Uh, the D.Y. reads This going forth is from beginning is from the beginning from the days of eternity. Does that make him the same as God. It is noteworthy that instead of saying days of eternity, the RS version renders the Hebrew as ancient days, the JB version days of old, and the New World book days of time indefinite. Viewed in the right in the light of uh, Revelation 3:14. Discussed above, Micah 5 2 does not, prov does not prove that Jesus was without a beginning. Does the Bible teach that none of those who are said to be uh, included in the Trinity is greater or less than another, that all are equal, that all are almighty? Mark 13.32 says, Of that day or that hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Of course, that would not be the case if the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were equal or co-equal. Uh, compromising one Godhead and uh, comprising of one Godhead. And if, as some suggest, the Son is limited by his human nature from knowing the question remains. I'll read that again. And if someone suggests that the Son is limited by his human nature from knowing, the question remains, why did the Holy Spirit not know? Matthew 2, 20-23 The mother of the sons of Zebedee said to him, Jesus, Command that these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom.
But Jesus answered, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. How strange! If as claimed Jesus is God, was Jesus here merely answering according to his human nature? If the Trinitarians say Jesus was truly God, man, God as a man, both God and man, not one or the other, would it truly be con consistent to report to such an explanation? Does not Matthew 20, 20 23 rather show that the Son is not equal to the Father? That the Father has reserved some pre... or whatever, <laughs> for himself. <laughs> I really can't read that word. <laughs> um, Matthew 12, 31 and 32 <laughs> says, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever says a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. If the Holy Spirit were a person and were God, this text would flatly contradict the Trinity doctrine, because it would mean that in some way the Holy Spirit was greater than the Son. Instead, what Jesus said shows that the Father to whom the Spirit belongs is greater than Jesus and uh, Jesus the Son of Man. John fourteen twenty two says, Jesus said, If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. First Corinthians eleven three, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Clearly then, Christ is not God, and God is of superior rank to Christ. It, showed, it should be noteworthy that this was written about 55 CE some 22 years after Jesus returned to heaven. So the truth here stated applies to the relationship between God and Christ in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28 says, God has put all things in subjection under his, as Jesus, feet. But when it says all, th all things are put in subjection under him, it is plain that he is expected, sorry, he is accepted who puts all things under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things under him that God may be everything to everyone. The Hebrew word shad day day in the Greek word pentokato are both translated almighty. Both original language words are repeatedly applied to Jehovah, the Father. Uh, Exodus 6.3, Revelations 19.6 Neither expression is ever applied to either the Son or the Holy Spirit. Does the Bible teach 
that each of those <clears throat> said to be part of the Trinity is God. Jesus said in prayer, Father, this is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John seventeen one to 3 the italics added, most translations here use the expression, the only true God, with references to the Father, um, who alone art truly God. He cannot be the only true God, the one who alone is truly God. If there are two others who are God, to the same degree as he is, can he? Any others referred to as gods must be either false or merely a reflection of the true God. 1 Corinthians 8, 5 and 6 says, Although there are many being so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, Lord, from whom all are, from whom are all things and from whom we exist. And the one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. Uh, the, the the presence the father as the one God of Christians as being in a class distinct from Jesus Christ just gotta go put some power to this I'll be back sorry about that I had to move um, and the central heating might be a little bit noisy but yeah please bear with me 1 Peter 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Repeatedly, even following Jesus' ascension to heaven, the scriptures refer to the Father as the God of Jesus. At John 20 17, following Jesus' resurrection, he himself spoke of the Father as my God. Later, uh, when in heaven, he recorded at Revelation 3.12, he again used the same expression. But never in the Bible is the Father reported to refer to the Son as my God. Nor does either the Father or the Son refer to the Holy Spirit as my God. In Theological Investigations, Carl Rayner S.J. admits, God is still never used of, never used of the Spirit and... Literally, the God is never used in the New Testament to speak of the Holy Spirit. Baltimore, M.D., 1961, translated from German, Volume 1, page 138 to 143. Do any of the scriptures that are used by the Trinitarians to support their belief provide a solid base for that dogma. A person who is really seeking to know the truth about God is going to search the Bible hoping to find a text that he can construct as fitting what he already believes. He wants to know that God's word itself says... 
he may find some texts that he feels can be read in more than one way. But when these are compared with the biblical statements on the same subject, their meaning will become clear. It should be noted that the outset, oh, at the outset, that most of the texts used as proof of the Trinitarian actuary, uh, the Trinity, actually mention only two persons. Note, not three. So even if the Trinitarian explanation of the texts were correct, these would not prove that the Bible teaches the Trinity. Consider the following. Useless, oh sorry, unless otherwise indicated, all the texts quoted in the following section are from the R.S. Is the Revised Standard Version section, oh sorry, second edition, 971. Text in which a little, sorry, a title that belongs to Jehovah is applied to Jesus Christ or is claimed to apply to Jesus. Alpha and Omega. To whom does this title properly belong. At Revelations 1.8, its owner is said to be God, the Almighty. In verses 11, according to the King James, that title is applied to one whose description thereafter shows him to be Jesus Christ. No, thereafter to be Jesus Christ. But scholars recognise the references to Alpha and Omega in verses 11 to be super superfluous. And so it does not appear in the... Well, there's a heap of books there. In the Revised Standard Version... translations of revelations into Hebrew recognize that the one described in in verses 8 is Jehovah and so they restore the personal name of God there in the uh, new world is it it is the Take too long. Um, 1984 reference edition. Revelations 21, 6 and 7 indicates that Christians who are spiritually con conquerors are to be sons of the one known as the Alpha and the Omega. That is never said of the relationship of Spirit atoned Christians to Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of them as his brother. In Hebrews 2.11 and Matthew 12.50 and also 25.40 But those brothers to Jesus are referred to as sons of God 
Galatians 3, 26 and 4, 6. At Revelations 22:12 on the TEV, inserts the name Jesus, so the reference to Alpha and Omega in verses 13 is made to appear to apply to him. But the name Jesus does not appear in appear there in Greek, and other translations um, do not include it. At Revelations 22:13, the Alpha and Omega is also said to be the first and the last. Which expression is is applied to Jesus at Revelations 1, 17, 18? Similarly, I hate that word, the expression apostle is applied to both Jesus and to certain others of his followers. But that does not prove that they are the same person or are of equal rank, does it? And Hebrews one uh, three one. So the evidence points to the conclusion that the title Alpha and Omega applies to Almighty God, the Father, not the Son. Savior. <clears throat> Repeatedly, the scriptures refer to God as Savior. At Isaiah. 43.11 God even says Besides me there is no saviour Since Jesus is also referred to as a saviour Are God and Jesus the same? Not at all Titus 1.3 and 4 speaks of God our saviour And then of both God the Father and, Je- and Christ Jesus our saviour so both persons are saviors. Jude 25 shows the relationship saying God our saviour uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord, italics added. Uh, can also see Acts 13.23 at Judges, and at Judges uh, 3.9 the same Hebrew word Moshiach. Shire, rendered saviour or deliverer, that is used at Isaiah forty three eleven, is applies is applied to Othenel, Othenel, a judge in Israel, but that certainly did not make Othenel Jehovah, did it? A reading of Isaiah 43, 1 to 12 shows that verse 11 means that Jehovah alone was the one who provided salvation or deliverance for Israel. That salvation did not come from any of the gods of the surrounding nations. God. At Isaiah 43, 10, Jehovah says, Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Does this mean that because Jesus Christ is prophetically called mighty God at Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus must be Jehovah? Again, the context answers, no, none of the idolatrous Gentile nations formed a God before Jehovah because no one existed before Jehovah nor would they at any future time from any real live God that was able to prophecy in Isaiah 46 9 and 10 but that does not that does not mean that Jehovah never caused to exist anyone who is properly referred to as a God. At Psalms uh, 82, 1 and 6, and and in John 1, 1, the new word, at Isaiah 10, 21, Jehovah is referred to as Almighty God, just as Jesus is in Isaiah 9, 6, but only Jehovah is ever 
but only Jehovah is ever called God Almighty. Genesis 17.1 If a certain title or descriptive uh, phrase is found in more than one location in the scriptures, it should never hastily be concluded that it must always refer to the same person. Such, such reasoning should lead to the conclusion that Nebuchadnezzar was Jesus Christ, because both were called King of Kings. Daniel 2.37 and Revelation 17.14 and that Jesus, Jesus' disciples were actually Jesus Christ, because both were called the light of the world. Matthew 5.14 and John 8.12 we should always be considered we should always consider the context and any other instance in the bible where the same expression occurs application to jesus christ by inspired bible writers of passages from the hebrew scriptures that clearly apply to jehovah What does John 1, 23 quote Isaiah 43 and apply to what John the Baptizer did in preparing the way for Jesus Christ? When Isaiah 43 is clear, is clearly discussed preparing the way before Jehovah because Jesus represents his father. He came in his father's name and had the assurance that his father was always with him because he did the things pleasing to his father. John 5, 43 and 8, 29. Why does heaven, oh sorry, why does Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 quote Psalms 102, 25 to 27? And apply it to the psalm. When the psalm says, when the psalm says that that it is addressed to God, because the Son is the one through whom God performed the creative works, they're described by the psalmists. Up there, described by the psalmists. See Colossians 5.15 and 16 and also Proverbs 8.22 and 27-30. It should be observed in Hebrews 1.5b that a quotation is made from 2 Samuel 7.14 that applied to the Son of God. Although that text had its first application to Solomon, the later application of it to Jesus Christ does not mean that Solomon and Jesus are the same. Jesus is greater than Solomon and carries out a work foreshadowed by Solomon. Luke 11.31 Scriptures that mention together the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19 and 2 Corinthians 13, 14, 13, 14 are instances of this. Neither of, neither of these texts says that Father, Son and Holy Spirit are co-equal or the same or that they are all gods or they are all God. The scriptural evidence already presented on pages of, yeah, argues against the reading, uh, the rendering, the reading, such thoughts into texts. Uh, McClintock and Strong's Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological and Ecclesiastical Literature Although advocated the Trinity doctrine, acknowledges rendering Matthew twenty-eight 
18 to 20. This text, however, taken by himself, would not prove decisively either the personality of the three subjects mentioned or either equality or uh, divinity. 1981, reprint, volume X, page 552. Regarding other texts that also mention the three together, this cyclopedia admits that taken by themselves, they are insufficient to prove the Trinity. Compare 1 Timothy 5.21, where God and Christ and the angels are mentioned together. Text in which the plural uh, form of nouns is applied to God in the Hebrew Scriptures. Hmm. At Genesis 1 1, the title God is translated from Elohim, which is uh, plural in Hebrew. Trinitarians con con construe this to be an indication of the Trinity. They also explain Detrimony 6.4 to imply the unity of members of the Trinity when it says, The Lord of God, the Elohim, is one Lord. The plural, uh, the plural form of the noun, here in Hebrew is the plural of majesty or excellence. In in oh, sorry, it conveys no thought of plurality or persons within a Godhead. In similar fashion, at Judges six twenty three, when references when reference is made to the false god uh, Dagon a form of the title Elohim is used the accompanying verb is singular showing that reference is to just the one God at Genesis 42 30 Joseph is speaking of is spoken of as the Lord Adonai, the plural of excellence of Egypt. So he was, he was called, Joseph is spoken of as the Lord of Egypt. The Greek language does not have the plural of majesty or excellence. So at Genesis 1.1, the translators of LXX used Hothios. Uh, a lowercase h o uh, uppercase t lowercase h e o s God singular as the equivalent of Elohim at Mark 12 29 where a reply of Jesus is reproduced in which he quoted Detrimony 6.4 the Greek singular, herathos, uh, is similarly used at Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Hebrew text contains the tetragrammation twice. And so should one, uh, so should more prof, uh, properly read. And so should more properly read, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. The nation of Israel to whom that was stated did not believe in the Trinity. The Babylonians and Egyptians worshipped triads of gods. But it was made clear to, the Israel, to Israel that Jehovah is different. Right. 
There's a lot of scriptures. A lot of scriptures. Um, so, we just go, I'll just go to some questions. Well, first I'll read this bit. In what position does belief in the Trinity put those who cling to it? It puts them in a very dangerous position. The evidence is indisputable that the dogma of the Trinity is not found in the Bible, nor is it in harmony with what the Bible teaches. It grossly misrepresents the true God, yet Jesus Christ said, The hour is coming. And now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. John 4, 23 and 24 says, Thus Jesus made it clear. Oh, well, it, it alludes to me. Thus Jesus made it clear that those who worship it, who worship, is not in truth. Thus Jesus made it clear that those who worship is not in truth, not in harmony with the truth set out in God's, God's own word. Are not true worshippers to Jewish religions? Oh, sorry. To Jewish religious religious leaders of the first century, Jesus said, "For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites." Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? When he said, this people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of man. Matthew fifteen six to 9 That applies with equal force to those in Christendom today who advocate human traditions in preference to the clear truths of the Bible. Regarding the Trinity, the Athesians' creed in English says that its members are incomprehensible. Teachers of the doctrine often state that it is a mystery. Obviously, such a Trinity God is not the one that Jesus had in mind when he said, we worship what we know. John 4, 22. Do you really know the God you worship? Serious questions confront each one of us. Do we sincerely love the truth? Do we really want an approved relationship with God? Not everyone genuinely loves the truth. Many have put having an, uh, the approval of their relatives and associates above love of truth and of God. Second Thessalonians 2, 9-12 and John 5, 39-44. But as Jesus said in earnest, in earnest prayer to his heavenly Father, this means everlasting life. They're taking in knowledge of you, the only true God, and of the one whom you sent forth, Jesus Christ. John 17, 3 and Psalms 144, 15 truthfully states, Happy is the people whose God is Jehovah. That be I. When someone says, Do you believe in the Trinity? You might reply, 
that it is very popular believing in the Trinity in these days. But did you know that this is not what is taught by Jesus and his disciples? So we worship the one that Jesus said to worship. When Jesus was teaching, here is the commandment that he said was greatest. At Mark 12, 28 to 30, Jesus never claimed to be equal to God. He said, at John 14, 28. And then what, then what is the origin of the Trinity Doctrine? Notice what well-known encyclopedias say about that. Um, no. I didn't, uh, if you don't, no I don't, I do not. You see, there are Bible texts that I could never fit in with that, never fit in with that belief. Here is one of them, Matthew 22, 24, 36. Perhaps you can explain, explain it to me. <laughs> if the Son is equal to the Father, how is it that the Father knows things that the Son does not? If they answer that this that this was uh, if they answer that this was true only regarding his human nature. But why does the Holy Spirit not know? If the person shows a sincere interest in the truth, show him what the scriptures do say about God. Another possibility. We do believe in Jesus Christ, but not in the Trinity. Why? Because we believe what the, what the Apostle Peter believed about Christ. Uh, what did he say there? Was, uh, Matthew 16, was it? Matthew 16, I think it was. Bear with me. Uh, he said to them, You thought you. Oh, sorry. You thought. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In, re in response, Jesus said to him, Happy are you, Simon, son of uh, Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven did. Also I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my congregation, and the gates of the grave will not be overpowered, will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of the heavens, and whatever you may bind on earth will already be bound in heaven, and whatever you may loosen on earth will already be loosened in heaven. Then he sternly instructed his disciples not to tell anybody what he, that he was Christ. Okay. Um, I find that not everyone has the same, th same thing in mind when um, they refer to the Trinity. Perhaps um, um, I appreciate that explanations, but what I believe is only what the Bible teaches. Have you ever seen the word Trinity in the Bible? 
referred to the, concor the concordance in your Bible? But is Christ referred to in the Bible? Yes. And we believe in him. Notice here, in the concordance under Christ, one of the references is to Matthew 16.16. 16. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that's what, what we believe. That's what I believe. If a person uh, draws particular attention to John 1.1, 1, 1, um, I am acquainted with that verse. It's... Uh, says sorry in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God not God not the word was God the word was a God Jesus was a God okay um, I am acquainted with that with that verse in some Bible translations, it says that Jesus is God. And others say that he is a God. Why is that? Could it be the next verse says what, what he was? Because it says he was with God. Mighty, uh, mighty, uh, sorry, might it also be because of what is found here at John 1.18? Where it says, No man has, has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is at the Father's side is the one who has explained him. So what, what he's saying is no one has seen God. They've only seen his begotten God, which is Jesus. Okay. Um, have you ever wondered whether Jesus himself worshipped someone as God? In John twenty seventeen, let's say, um, oh, I'll read it. Says. Jesus said to, he, to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Okay? Um... Do you believe in the divinity of Christ? Yes, I certainly do. But perhaps I do not have in mind the same thing that you do when you refer to it, the divinity of Christ. Why do I say that? Well, at Isaiah 9.6, Jesus is described as mighty God. But only his father is ever referred to in the Bible as Almighty God. Mighty and Almighty aren't the same words. Almighty and just mighty. And notice that at John 17, 3, Jesus speaks of his father as the only true God. So at most, Jesus is just a reflection of the true God. What is required on our part to be pleasing to God? Uh, John 4, is that John 4? 23, I believe. Uh, 23, where is it? Nevertheless, 
the hour is coming and it is now when the true it is now when the the true worshippers with worship uh, will worship the father with spirit and truth for indeed the father is looking for ones like these to worship him god is a spirit and those worshiping him must worship with spirit and truth the woman said to him i know the messiah is coming who is called christ whenever that one comes he will declare all things to us openly jesus said to her i am he i am he the one speaking to you So, Jesus never referred to himself as God. As a matter of fact, he came to make his father's name known. Also, he said, said outright, that he is one with Jehovah, the same as his followers are one with him. And what they're saying, what he's saying is, they all have the same mindset, and that's that also is in creating us, because when Jehovah said to Jesus, "We'll make him in our image," he wasn't saying we'll make him look like us. He was saying we'll make him to reflect our qualities, which is exactly what we are. We are reflections of him. But we weren't supposed to know the dark side. Satan saw to that. But, yeah, it's not... It's not how we think. It's not how they are teaching. You need to be really careful. Especially with um, Catholicism. Because a lot of people look at them as like they're an authority, and they're so big, and they've got you know so many numbers, and they're all over the world, not <laughs> the world, the flat earth. They're everywhere. Um, yeah, you can walk into any Catholic church, most churches. I don't think I know any besides maybe one that doesn't have any decorations, um, doesn't have a statue of Mary or a, or a cross or some pagan thing. Um, and also, they have collection plates. They hand out collection plates. You're not supposed to do that. The Bible tells us that you receive the word free, you give it free. You're not supposed to charge people for it. The priests who get paid for teaching the Bible is wrong. It's against what the Bible says. And also, um, aren't they supposed to be receiving their reward from Jehovah? Why would they want anything now? And if they're teaching things like the Trinity and stuff, well, there you go. Fair enough. Fine. Might as well ask for money for teaching people lies. Yeah? You're teaching them the truth. Well, see, if they were actually teaching people the true word of God and not their dogmas, then they'd be definitely, you know, trying to make money off God's word. But what they're doing is they twist it to say what they want, to scare people into handing over their cash. <laughs> That's all they're doing. They want your money. Just like the rest of the system, Satan's system. It's full of evil, nastiness, and greediness. And unfortunately, we have to go through it to get to the good bit. And the good bit will be everlasting. So it's worth it now to align yourself. It's worth it now to do what's needed. The longer you wait, the harder it'll be. The, the more you... It's like trying to give up smoking, I suppose. They say the, the more times you try, the, the more, more chance of success. But 
if you don't try, then yeah, you're not going to succeed at all. You, you can't. You can't succeed. No way. So you've got to put in effort. You've got to give it your all. And if you accept teachings from men, other people, as truth of God and truth about Jesus and just truth about yourself, your your life, your your soul, yourself, you, life. You're teaching you things and you're believing it and it's not true. Then it's just because you don't want to put the time in to find out and it's easier just to believe them because they tell you they're the authority and they've done their homework, they've done it all, no need to worry about it, put your money in the table, pass it around three or four times during the session, put your money in there, then come up and we'll do the communion as well where you can receive the wine and the bread. That's completely wrong too, people. Totally wrong. That is not for everybody. You know that when Jesus was on earth, at the time when they broke bread and they um, did the communion, um, Jesus had many followers like us. Hundreds, thousands. He had lots and lots of followers. But the only ones present at the communion were the disciples. We are to observe the communion but we're not supposed to partake. We're not supposed to drink the, the wine, the blood of Jesus, and we're not supposed to eat the bread unless we are anointed. If we were supposed to be doing that every Sunday or Saturday or whatever, because apparently that's what they do, isn't it? They do it every week. If we were supposed to do it, and, and we were supposed to consume it, it wasn't just for those apostles then he would have done it with all his followers when they were on the mountain, when he was when he made all the fish and the bread, both times, you know? And that tells you right there how many followers, he had many, many followers. So if that communion was for everybody, he would have done it with everybody, but he didn't, did he? He did it with his disciples only. That tells you something. And it also tells us to... Um, what's it called? Um, to observe, to observe this. It doesn't, but not doesn't tell us to partake in it. Okay. So if you're drinking the wine and you're eating the bread, then you're basically saying, as far as you're concerned, you're anointed, you're an apostle, and you are worthy. Do you think? Would you think you're worthy? Really? Because. I'm pretty sure the only way you can be considered worthy is through Jehovah, by anointing you. So just be careful, people. And, yeah, thumbs up. Great. Good session. I enjoyed it. Sorry, I'm not a very good reader. But, um, yeah. That's not the point. The point is the knowledge and the truth. And the love. The love. The love, the love. What it's all about. Okay. So yeah, tomorrow I'm doing my next experiment. My next experiment of the uh, mysterious globe, and it's going to be about tides. And I'm going to prove that the tides aren't made by the moon. So be on the lookout for that one, and I hope you enjoyed this one. Much love, everybody. God bless you all, and thanks. Bye.